Wayne Bennett here from ECRM and Range Me. And uh, again, this is our first edition of ECRM Beauty Talks. And it's so exciting to have no one other than Andrea Harrison, who is the VP uh, Merchant Manager for the Beauty and Personal Care Division of CVS Health. Let me just quickly tell you about Andrea, and we'll get into the questions and answers. So Andrea joined CVS in 2005 as a business analyst uh, in personal care, and she was quickly transitioned to support the Albertsons acquisition and integration, and then promoted to category manager in 2007, um, where she led the shave and then the photo desks. And uh, then she helped lead the integration of the Longs business. A lot of integrations there for you, Andrea. And uh, did such a great job. She was then promoted to senior director to front store strategy, uh, which time she became a DMM of general merchandise and then personal care and then beauty care. And then subsequently in 2020, she became the VP of personal care and beauty care. So prior to joining CVS, she worked uh, as a con senior consultant in retail strategy at both Deloitte and Accenture. So good for her. Hold on. Let me get rid of that. Okay. And holds an undergraduate degree from Boston College uh, with a double major in finance and marketing and an MBA from Bryant University. And I know she lives in Massachusetts with her husband and three children. So, Andrea, thank you for being here. Appreciate your time. And uh, how's it going? Of course, it, it's going. Um, as you just listed off a bit of my, my life story there, Wayne, but like the three kids certainly keep things hopping in addition to the business that I run. So, I've heard sure. a dull moment here. Sure. So, Andrea, I know you've jumped from another meeting and I know you've got meetings uh, scheduled throughout the day and I appreciate you being here. And again, we're going to try to hold this down to like 145 and then uh, let you go. But let's get into it. Okay. So, Andrea, I know uh, CVS has always uh, talked about the link between beauty and health. And what I'm curious to know is what does CVS do to activ activate around that connectivity? Yeah, so I, I love this question because as America's leading healthcare solution company, but also one of the largest beauty retailers in the United States, we actually have kind of a unique position. Um, and through all of that, we have a history of putting our customers and their health at the heart of the decisions that we make to help establish ourselves as the country's most trusted local health and wellness destination. I say that that way really deliberately because the word wellness um, is a really important part of that. I think historically, even in our business, you'd hear us talk about our healthcare business as health and wellness. And, and that really meant the corner of the store out in front of the pharmacy. But I think what's happened today and why this question is so important at this moment in time is, is we find ourselves in a, I won't even say post-pandemic, I don't know what mode we're in now, but let's just say on this end of the pandemic, um, you know, I think the customer has defined wellness and well-being for their lifestyles really differently and in, in a much broader way. And so we think about activating um, our business and, and our customers and their priorities against what is now a really different definition of health and wellness than a customer might have brought to bear four or five years ago. So for example, when you ask customers today how they define wellness, they don't just talk about pain relievers and vitamins, which they certainly do and are critical, but they also talk about appearance. They talk about fitness, nutrition, mindfulness, sleep all of the things that create a holistic sense of well-being for people. And for us to deliver on our aspiration to be that trusted local health and wellness destination, we have to be right across all of the ways the customer defines wellness. And so That's great. Yep. we'll activate in ways that, that amplify that through our assortments that bring authority to life. Um, for example, in beauty, we'll focus on things that are um, ingredient-led, have clinical backing, um, bring that sort of self-care element of of beauty to the to bear. I think that also helps serve um, to fill that authority for wellness. Um, we'll also continue to talk about trend. I think it's hard to have authority and beauty without trend. Yeah. Um, and perhaps most importantly, we'll continue to evolve our assortments to reflect the communities that we serve. I think the other sort of component of that wellness definition is it's, no, it's not the same for any two people and certainly isn't the same for any two communities across all the communities that we serve. So we think about activating against it in all of those ways. And those are just assortment ways. I think we think about it in terms of messaging, in terms of um, the experience at store and all, all of the pieces that come together. Yeah, that's great, Andrea. Thank you. And I did want to mention to the audience that 
We will try to leave some time for Q&A. So if you get your, your questions in sooner, you're more likely to have them answered. So uh, the chat line is open. So please send those forward. So Andrea, thank you for explaining that. And I know it's an important uh, aspiration and something that you, you and the team work on very diligently. But let's talk a little bit about some of the activation points around that. So I know in the past you have talked about uh, the Beauty Mark Initiative. And I know that's something that CVS has really led uh, uh, in. Can you give us an update on that and how that's going and why that continues to be an important aspect of your uh, priority? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think you've heard me in the past say, we talk about purpose every single day, every single day. And one of the um, sort of most salient, I think, things we're really conscious of at this moment in time is, is just the demands on people and the, the status of mental health that we deal with. And I think what's most, um, I think, you know, compelling to me still about Beauty Mark, even after all of these years, is that it was really developed with the mental health of our customers in mind and continues to be so important as a result. So back in 2018, we recognized that material retouching happening, particularly in the beauty industry, was really starting to have a negative impact on young people in particular, but, but women of all ages at the time. Um, and, and we made the decision to be the first retailer to say, you know what, we're, we're not going to do this. We're not going to materially alter images. We want people to feel good about themselves in our aisles. And therefore, we have to show people as real people. And I think, you know, since that time, um, we've gotten to a place where we're 100% compliant. We use only unretouched assets across all of our assets. We have a tremendous number of supplier partners and images in their support. We've enlisted a number of influencers and been able to really create a bit of a movement on our side. Um, but it continues to be important because I think we've probably all heard those conversations, even in the last six to 12 months around social media and the impact of staring at ourselves like this all day. Mm -hmm. And so as we think about, um, you know, the role we would like to play in, in mental health broadly as an enterprise, it actually it ties back to your first question as well. It's a, it's a piece of wellness. That degree of confidence is why people choose to engage across wellness in so many ways. And so to the extent that the efforts we're making um, help people feel a little better in their aisles, or, or more broadly, the efforts that we're making are moving the industry. And we've seen a number of supplier partners um, agree to, to come on board with us. And, and I've had conversations over the course of the last several years with suppliers we don't do business with, and might not because they're in different channels, but who are so excited they've made the same commitments. Yeah. And so to see that impact across the industry, I think, as you know, beauty is, is so image-centric, um, to continue to build on that has been um, probably one of the most memorable things in my career for sure. But it's yep. exciting to see that we continue to have impact even after five years of working at this. Yeah, that's great, Andrea. And, uh, you know, kudos for your leadership on that. I, I know you were, I think, one of the first retailers, if not the first retailer to come out with the authenticity of uh, imagery in your promotions and marketing. Um, Andrea, so, uh, you know, we're just about a week or so, two weeks away from Memorial Day here on the East Coast. And, you know, I'm going to start to bring out my sun, sun, sun tanning products and things like that, of course. And another priority or activation around your purpose has been around skin safe. Yes. And I'm curious to know if you can give us an update on that and where that fits within the, uh, the, the strategic initiatives and uh, tell us more about that skin safe. Yeah, of course. When I was talking a little bit about assortment, you heard me talk a little bit about ingredients. And one of the things I think that's really been interesting coming out of the course of the last few years is that customers have become really savvy. They know what they want to seek out for different, different benefits. They know what they want to avoid. Um, and, and while customers are really savvy, there's so much to choose from and so many things to navigate and so many concerns people have about their health and the safety of the things they use on themselves and the people that they love who they shop for. And so what our partnership with SkinSafe has enabled us to do is to provide deselection for those customers who tell us they have sensitive skin. That is upwards of 70% of the population that will tell you they have sensitive skin. Some large number of those individuals were actually seeking out support and assistance from our pharmacists to help navigate what was safe for them. And so when we started with, um, with the SkinSafe organization, we started with tagging that was sensitive friendly, predominantly in skincare. And to your point, it, it rolls throughout facial and hand and body lotion and sun care and all of the places where people might be concerned about um, the safety, if they are sensitive, of the ingredients that they're choosing to put on them. Um, we've seen a tremendous amount of success and sort of interest in that space. It is uh, safety, I think, is of utmost concern to customers at this moment in time. And so it's been nice to be able to, to provide that deselection for customers. And we'll build on that success in the coming months at this point. Um, to start to bring that degree of deselection, that degree of safe for sensitive 
um, clarity to other categories, including cosmetics. And then we'll work through some others in the, in the months that follow, but uh, more to come there. Hey, Andrea, is there an opportunity for a manufacturer to, in terms of that focus to work also to, to support that within the pharmacy department? Because of the um, pharmacist's recommendation. So the pharmacists are, as you know, incredibly busy individuals. And so what we've actually done with SkinSafe is actually tried to take some pressure off the pharmacist. So they're getting okay. less questions about skincare and okay. enable that customer who was seeking pharmacist input to leverage that tagging to help them navigate. And moreover, we've also have some other shelf indications in our stores for product that's dermatologist tested as another way to help bring the clinical efficacy and the clinical expertise that we have to the shelf to help make it a little bit easier. We know pharmacists are busy. We know customers are busy. And that time sure. to take, you know, while you have a, a screaming toddler with you, perhaps, or somebody waiting in the car or a meeting you're running to or a soccer game, I mean, you name it, right? Our customers are drawn in so many directions. We found any way that we can help simplify and make those deselection steps faster um, yep. helps everyone. Yeah, I mean, it certainly makes a lot of sense to bring that education and accessibility closer to the consumer. So 100%. good job on that. Um, Andrea, I know a few weeks ago, uh, we worked together to support an initiative around diverse suppliers. And can you give us a little bit of a perspective on the importance of diversification of your supplier base uh, at CVS and maybe share a little bit about that journey and how it's going and, and what kind of priorities or expectations you put there? Yeah, sure. I think I think we are at our absolute best in terms of serving our communities when we reflect the communities we serve. And so um, realizing that this is a job, we are probably not moving fast enough and we'll also probably never be able to say, yay, we're done, right? That's not going to happen. This is going to be a constant evolution to make sure that we have the best product from the best group of suppliers who, who accurately reflect the communities we serve and their needs. And so um, I know we got some great feedback from the team about that event. They were able to meet with tons of suppliers um, in terms of, of just people who, who bring different experiences to the table, whose products um, came to mind from, from needs that they had, right? The experiences of, of, their, own, of their own. And so, um, you know, moving forward, we will continue to um, grow the percentage of products that we bring to the shelf, the number of things that we bring that reflect those communities. We're doing some work kind of on the back end to make sure we can get the products in the right stores so we can be mm -hmm. as effective as possible for everybody. We know it's hard for small suppliers to go into 8,000 stores immediately, so we want to be smart about that. Right. Um, but we're also working on the ways that we communicate it. So today we have a, a program called Proud to Partner, where we have been messaging on shelf some of the founder brands that we brought in. We've got some landing page activity on CBS.com to help call, that atten call attention to that. And we continue to find ways to build on that messaging, having created or having hosted rather um, a multi-part Instagram live interview series with some of the founder brands that are part of that program. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, as we start to build out um, a resonance with the community and a uh, clarity around what we're doing and how, how it will come to light. Great. So it's certainly a journey. It's not a destination and it's uh, fluid and ongoing. 100%. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, Andrea, I know in the past we've talked and uh, we've worked with the team and maybe you can share a little bit with us about some different formats and beauty that you have, like a beauty in real life, IRL, and also the Lux format. Uh, maybe you could share some light on that and what the suppliers on the call need to know a little bit about some of that activity. Sure. Maybe I'll take a minute just to explain what beauty IRL is. Yeah, 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 please. Yeah, I, yeah, I realize. Like you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, beauty in real life is our sort of most most forward beauty footprint. And we have today about a, a little over 150. We'll have about 165 by the end of the year. And those formats actually have sort of our most extreme, most involved version of a beauty experience in store. Um, we typically have increased amounts of floor space. We have very different experiences, different floors, different lighting, different shelving, a very different layout. Um, and they're traditionally located in markets that have a really high density of beauty shoppers, and we were able to, I think, we start to materially influence the, the beauty community. But it also allows us to bring in products and, and sort of act as a bit of a sandbox to say, if we bring in a brand that might be a little bit more expensive, or we want to bring in a brand that's a little bit um, more nascent and like needs more time to grow, but we think it has resonance with the beauty community. Those are the doors in which we have the latitude to do those things because we have a bit more space and a bit more control over the physical experience. Yep. And so... Um, you know, we, as much as we start the conversation talking about health and wellness, I think what's what's most compelling to me about those formats is it's a really good reminder for myself and my team that beauty always needs to be fun. 
right? People engage in this for lots of reasons, but let's be clear, confidence and experimentation are big parts of that storyline. Sure. And so what we've seen in that model through those doors is that we've been able to generate bigger baskets, a younger average customer age, more frequent trips with that sort of more beauty first elevated experience. Um, and so it's been a really good set of learnings. It's been a, we've you know, taken some brands through there and begun to scale them. We have a series of new brands coming into those formats later this year. Um, but what I think is most exciting about it is that how fast we're learning from it. And so based on the success of that, knowing that it is hard to take over, it is a material percentage of the store. I don't know exactly how big it is, but it is, takes some, it takes a chunk out of some of the other parts of the store. So what we're working right. on now is a way to figure out how we take everything we've learned and the best of, and um, amplify that in more doors. So, so maybe not with the same degree of, um, of breakthrough that we have in those stores, but um, certainly something that we can get to more doors and, and help impact more customers. We impact customers in a lot of key markets today to beauty in real life. But what I'd love to ultimately do is bring that level of accessibility for some of those interesting brands and, and experiences to more customers. Okay, that's great. Uh, and Andrea, is there anything about Lux you want to share or Yep. So we're still super early days, a couple of um, pilot stores okay. um, in a few locations where we're, we're pushing the envelope predominantly on skincare. And um, so we're looking forward to, again, learning really quickly or as quickly as we can from those experiences um, and figuring out how we, again, bring, bring the best of skincare to the forefront. We think um, in the conversation customers are having about well-being and about ingredients, skincare is a huge part of that conversation and tends to be... Um, kind of the, the first place people go at this point in time as they look at that appearance pieces. Am I starting with the right canvas? And okay. so um, bringing the best of skincare choices to mass is, is an aspiration we have for those moments. Okay. And I, and I guess one additional follow-up question, Andrea, just in terms of formats and focus, what is the beauty and personal care assortment look like in your health hub stores? Yeah, this is actually a great question. Something I should have touched on, actually. So um, it depends. It's kind of the answer. Um, in some number of the health hub stores where we don't have um, as deep a beauty sales base, it, it's our traditional assortment. We don't. We um, okay. we've expanded some key sets like um, oral health and, and a little bit of skincare in some places to help marry up with the okay. the role that those stores play in those communities. But in a um, a number of our health hubs, we actually have married them up with our beauty and real life format. So you truly have sort of our best of in those locations. And so it brings a much more elevated experience to beauty as well as health, and it becomes a more cohesive story. And those are fairly new, probably in the last 18 months or so that those are, are at scale. Um, but we're excited. Um, they have they've tend to be productive and um, folks are really engaged with them. So excited to see what more we can learn from that. Okay, great. Let me just clear this off my screen. Okay. Um, Andrea, I think the last time we spoke, you said something and I wrote it down here to frame the next question uh -oh. and you, no, no, it's all good. I love the quote. I'm, I'm, I'm only quoting a good quote. You said, everyone is becoming a chemist, a dermatologist, dermatologist driven. Uh, you basically said everyone is becoming a chemist. Um, and so with that said, I think you said it earlier, maybe even more globally, uh, today, as we sit here on May 19th, um, what key product trends do you see emerging in today's marketplace? Yeah, it's, it's probably not entirely different from, from the day that I made that comment, I think, Wayne. So, you know, we continue to see a tremendous amount of momentum behind product that has clinical backing. Um, I think customers have so many choices, and sometimes it's really hard to know what's best for you or what's going to work. And so I think customers look for clinicians, look for influencers right, to be supporting the, the decisions that they're making. So I think products that have those really clear um, seals of approval, if you will. And I think products that are led with ingredients that people understand and, and um, are looking for, I think will continue to drive sales across categories. The other thing is we, we, along with that, we continue to see a skinification, if you will, of other categories. Hmm. ingredients like hyaluronic acid, right? They're historically skincare ingredients that now people understand. And now when they find them in their foundation or maybe even in their hair care, right, you're starting to see people bring the things they know are beneficial to them from a skincare perspective to other, other beauty categories that they shop. And so I right. think that trend um, will, will continue. I think it will also continue to drive innovation. I think people are looking for cleaner, safer, uh, more sustainable. I think a younger customer is absolutely um, demanding that. 
Yep. So, Andrea, I wanted to ask you this question um, and not so much to really divulge the challenges that you have in your job as the leader of personal beauty care, but really more as the challenges uh, that you have that you can share with the supplier community because a good supplier should be a collaborative partner, one who brings solutions. And I asked the question in that frame. So what are the challenges that you have and what can suppliers think about or bring forward to you beyond their product to help solve some of the challenges that you have for category growth? I think, I, you know, and, and this is probably not a surprise to anybody on this call, but I think the biggest challenge we have these days continues to be inventory and supply chain. Um, it, is, it is something I think we are all spending far more time than we ever anticipated talking about. I know if you add up my entire years doing this, I've talked about it more on the last 24 months than I did in probably the X number of years before that. Right. Um, and I think as we think about that, one of the most important conversations we've been having is transparency, right? So, yep. so what suppliers can bring to us, I think, to be great partners beyond the product is, is a level of, of transparent partnerships. So and when you have a problem, we know about it. We know when we can expect product or when we can't expect product so that we can set the right expectations together and build plans that, that delight our customers, right? If we bet on something and it, for whatever set of reasons, it's been held up, we get it, stuff happens, right? Lots of stuff happens these days. Right. Um, but when we find out late and we can't pivot, it leaves all of us disappointing the customer. And so I think, you know, if I had one word in answer to that question, I would say transparency. Okay. And now that's great, Andrea. And I think another buzzword in today's very complicated upside down world is the concept of simplicity. So what can suppliers do to make their engagement with you more simple? Um, I think getting in touch with the right person, right? And so some of us is, we'll, we'll help with that. Some of this is the information is available. We've got to get you to the right, right individual. Um, but I think making sure that the conversations are focused and with the person who's actually going to make the decisions helps. It just makes, it makes the process smoother for everybody and takes steps out of the process. It leaves leaves, I think, the suppliers feeling less like they've had multiple steps to get to work with us and less like it's been difficult. Um, if we get you in touch with the right person, you're having the right conversation so that you you're with the decision maker. Um, okay. I also think what, um, to bring the simplicity idea to assortments, yeah. I think you know, we see a lot, of, a lot of assortments with long tails these days. And knowing how much choice there is on shelf um, and you know, how much we all struggle to get all of the products through the supply chain. I think in some cases being focused on the products and the innovation and the heroes that, that drive the business and, and being okay with not including all of the long tail items all the time, um, I think actually has a lot of benefit as it simplifies the shop for the customer who's already probably, you know, seeing a crazy number of choices depending on the space that we're talking about. Um, but also it helps the helps the story for the brand, right? We find heroes tend to, to drive the majority of, of product for a lot of brands. And so mm -hmm. thinking about assortments, um, not as, as uh, throw everything against the wall and keep adding on them, but, but edit to amplify. Right, okay, makes a lot of sense. Um, Andrea, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about maybe some things you wanna share about the importance of e-commerce uh, and cvs.com and what are you doing to drive uh, your business opportunity there online and what are some of the considerations that the suppliers today listening in should think about sure it is a really big focus for us i think there's um for those that maybe have worked with us in the past perhaps it was not the biggest area of focus um but with a bunch of new leadership across the organization the omni-channel focus is tremendous mm -hmm. in a way that i have in all of my 17-ish years here have never seen, which is incredibly exciting to all of us, I think. Um, it's been really remarkable to me actually to see how much of the business we've been able to maintain and grow kind of without those assets as we know the rest of the, the retail universe depends on them. Um, yeah. But we are very quickly bringing some of those to bear um, and are really excited about what we're seeing. So we have um, just started buy online pick up and store over the course of the last couple of months which we know is a capability customers want and we have been not able to offer for several years, um, but it will be up and running, is currently up and running in thousands of locations with the majority of the chain um, will be online shortly. And so that is, it seems like a, a really antiquated thing for me to say, like we should have been having this conversation 10 years ago, um, but we are finally there and we're seeing tremendous um, 
like uptake from our customers in terms of the the ability to use that or the desire to use that. And I think that comes from a, a new definition of convenience that we're excited to lean into. We've always been convenient. We're on 8,000 plus corners. Right. And so, you know, that's always been our definition of convenience. But consumers now, it, it's about wanting what they want, when they want it, how they want it. And yep. so today that might be, you know, I go into the store and pick it up tomorrow. I might want to order it online and have it show up, you know, have it ready in the store in an hour. And, and tomorrow I might be willing to have whatever it is shipped to my house, but we have to be there. However, the customer is looking for us to fill the need for them. And so lots of capabilities coming in the next 12 months to, to continue to draw that out. Yep. You know, Andrea, over the years, it's just amazing to watch the role of the evolution of the merchant. And, you know, back in the early days, I mean, the merchant was always very busy with reams of data that they always try to get through. But, you know, now today's merchant, modern merchant, not only has a 10x amplification of data, right? They also have to manage and navigate the omni-channel, right? Some merchants are even today working in the store, right? They have to, you know, not only manage their joint business partner relationships, and then they still have to find innovation. So with all of those things, right, affecting the merchant, my question is, if I am a small emerging supplier, and I do connect with the right person, what, what do I need in that presentation? What are the key, what are the key things in that presentation, or attributes, or communication points are optimal that I should bring forward to that merchant to capture their time, to capture their essence, to get them to do the next thing with me? Yeah, I think um, simple is great, right? You have a story to tell. The product tells a story, tell the story. And, and there's um, the other color just gets lost, frankly, in the, to your point, in the course of the day, like, there's so much going on. And so if the story is about the product is most important, right? What is the product? Who's, what customer need does it meet? Um, and then I know this might sound crazy, but cost and suggested retail, I can't tell you how many times over my 17 years doing this, I've sat down with a supplier who doesn't have that information in the deck. Mm. And I'm telling you the person you're sitting across can't do anything with what they've seen without having a clear understanding of what that is. Um, and so, so it sounds really basic, but I think, and the last piece I might add to that is to the extent that the brand is in distribution or on a DTC basis and you do have a social following, I think it is helpful, particularly in beauty at this point in time, to understand um, the size of the social following, the activations that your brand uses to develop their social following, to amplify the brand through social. Um, I think clarity to those things is important. We are constantly trying to weed through um, lots of, of smaller brands because it is actually really important to the space, but clearly, you know, it's a, it's a 12,000 square foot box, give or take. Right. And so um, we have to make a lot of hard choices. And so understanding the brands that our customers might already um, have recognized or might see in their feed sometimes helps us um, have that extra layer of confidence that a customer who has a really busy life to the point we started with and is running through the store might yep. stop and recognize it's, it's really hard to stop customers in their, in their busy lives yep. at shelf, unless it's yep. um, really something they're going and looking for. You know, Angie, it's funny. I, I want to get into the Q and a, and again, I want to be uh, solid on the, on the 145 end, but it's funny how you started with the consumer. You kind of ended with the consumer and I can't begin to tell you how many conversations I have with retailers and merchants who always talk about the need for the supplier to understand who their consumer is. I think that is an essential takeaway and you kind of book marked it book, you know, book ended it with the beginning and the end. And I think that's very important. And, and to, and for the, and for the supplier to understand who your consumer is and how does that brand product either add to the consumer base, create new consumers and not necessarily duplicate consumers because you don't want duplication. No, we want to grow all parts of the consumer base that we have, right? We want our best consumers to continue to find discovery with us and to try the next thing or add to the regimen or do whatever next step they need to take to improve on their existing sort of proactive wellness efforts. Right. But we also want those customers who shop us with maybe less frequency. We have a, a tremendous number of customers, frankly, in our stores over the course of the last two years as we've been part of the testing and vaccination processes. We want those customers to find something on our shelves to have a compelling experience in our stores so that they continue to come back. And so um, making sure that we're, we're conscious of the needs of those somewhat disparate groups is important to us. 
Okay, great. So let, let's go to some of the questions. I see they're rolling in. This is a very active group of questions. And so let me go to the to the question and answer here. Um, uh, okay, so here's a good question. Uh, Andrea, what is CVS's store brand strategy around sustainable packaging? Yes, yeah, so our store brand team has actually made some very specific commitments, but I, which I will not articulate in a way that does them justice. So I'm just going to be, maybe I'll be a little bit broad about them, um, about plans to um, improve the sustainability and to to be able to scale that across store brands in the next couple of years. I want to say it's 2025 or 2026 that they have plans to um, markedly make a change there. In some cases, it's actually quite difficult. There's a lot of requirements um, when you get to the healthcare side of the business around packaging that are actually going to make that a Herculean effort on the part of the store brands team, but they're absolutely committed to um, having impact there. Yep. And, and I know there's a question here. I know on the screen and Andrea, just FYI, your screen does say Lori Helms, but we are talking <laughs> to Andrea Harrison. I promised I clicked the right link. <laughs> yes. Okay. So this is Andrea Harrison, not Lori Helms, who is another a person within uh, CVS. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, okay. Let me see. Uh, okay. Uh, here's a question. I don't know if it's fully, uh, if I fully understand it, but you know, maybe there's something here. What type of digital retail solution does CVS have in mind for the future of its stores beside the website? So yeah. maybe as yeah. a, yeah, I mean, maybe the question is in terms of uh, a digital solution to enable beauty and personal care. Yes. Are there any tools? There are. There. So we're experimenting with some things right now to bring different um, virtual try-on or different product selection tools that are digital to the shelf. Um, and so we're still quite early days on that. I think it, what's been interesting to me about that is, you know, customers either love it or they won't touch it. Is is what we're finding, right? So customers either want to do everything from their phone and don't want to interact with another device or another experience in the store, um, or they're, they're eager to sort of take on that, that level of, of engagement. And so um, we're still very much in a learning phase on that, but it is something we're watching closely. Okay. Uh, Andrea has a question. What about gift sets rather than individual products? I think it depends on the store and the season for us. So for example, our Navarro locations and our Emos locations mm. have a tremendous amount of success with gift yep. sets. Um, yep. We see okay. really mixed results in the rest of the chain. And I think it's the nature of the shop. If you look at key holiday periods, we tend to be the, yep. the last minute, the fill in. And so, um, you know, where I would guide the team most of the time is there's a, there's a limited place and time for gift sets for us. Uh, Andrea, and you know, it, that's a good point to follow up. And just as you explained beauty IRL, maybe you could just spend a minute talking about Navarro and Emos. Oh, of course, I think, yes. I think that might be an important thing to bring up here. That is an excellent call out, Wayne. Thank you. Um, so within the 8,000, 9,000 plus stores that we have today, there are a number, um, particularly in the Southeast, they're predominantly in Florida. Um, we acquired the chain Navarro a number of years ago, and Navarro serves um, a very distinctly Hispanic consumer. It's a very different store experience. Um, it's a markedly different mix for some categories. There's a lot of um, additional product that, that meet the needs of a Hispanic consumer. And what we saw through those stores, which, I mean, the signage is bilingual. The stores are speaking multiple languages to their, to their customer base. Um, they also exist throughout, I believe, Puerto Rico at this point. Um, and so what we have done is taken what we've learned from those stores and in other highly Hispanic markets, we've actually um, been able to bring that degree of localization by leveraging what we learned in Navarro to stores we refer to as CVS Emos. So as you walk through one of those stores, you might experience a traditional set for, let's say, hair care, where you might find an additional four or eight feet of um, product that might even have um, you know, bilingual packaging, for example, that brings product potentially from other countries that meets the needs of that yep. particular and local Hispanic consumer. Yep. And uh, Emos, we talked about? Yeah, so that is Emos. So Navarro does yeah. that as well. And then we sort of copied pasted the best of to, into our Emos stores to make sure we could serve commu um, communities in other places. Right. And and Andrea, if I was a supplier and I'm looking at all these different opera channels, right? Online, uh, IRL, Lux, Emos, Navarro, all their CVS stores, right? Mainline, all these different opportunities and channels to sell. I go to the merchant. Yes. And when it comes to Navarro and Emos, there are a separate set of merchants um, out of an office in Miami. Um, but the, the CVS merchants whose names I believe are available on CVSflyers.com, if I'm not mistaken, to help get you routed to the right person. 
um, they can direct, if it's a product or, or a opportunity that is more specific to Navarro or Emos, they can absolutely help route you to the right merchants in that market. Okay. I'm looking at some other questions here. Sure. Uh, okay. I know, Andrew, I'm looking, if you, there's anything that grabs you. Um, I'm just scrolling through to see if there's any themes so I can try to get a few at once. Well, there's a question here. I'm not familiar with this particular program, but it's interesting. Uh, how, how do you become a candidate for the Proud Partner Program? Yep. So Proud to Partner is- Who's the um, contact? Yep. So um, it's being led by Dina Melnick, who is the director of our hair business. Okay. Um, and she's, we've just started to actually roll that out to some other categories, but um, Dina Melnick, again, is, is probably a great person to start with. That, pro that program has both signage in store and, and some landing page material and call outs online um, mm -hmm. where we are um, amplifying product that are um, predominantly either black owned or black founded brands. Um, and so we're, we're working to scale that messaging at the moment to, to some other categories It started with our hair care business, expanded to our beauty mm -hmm. businesses. I'm in a few spots and, and we continue to work through that as, as you guys all know, executing signage in these stores can be really challenging. So we're working now on some other digital amplifications for that storyline. Okay, but it is a, um, a program that we, we use to help make sure that the founder stories are, are at the forefront. Um, I think the answer to the question is yes. Thank you for answering that. And for the, and for the participant who asked the question, thank you for asking the question. I was not familiar with that program. So thank you. Uh, uh, are brand SKUs not stocked in brick and mortar able to be added to .com? Um, yes, is the short answer. I think we are still a little bit away from being able to do it um, at scale, but I suspect, um, particularly, you know, depending on the category, the prioritization of that will we'll ramp pretty quickly, starting with um, skin, I want to say, from our side um, in the coming months. So, yes, it's a little bit harder today, but I suspect by six months from now, which should be a much easier yes. Okay. Um, uh, here's another question. So as a supplier for health and beauty, do I need an agent, a broker, present my product to CBS, or there is another way? Um, no, you don't need one. You're certainly welcome to get in touch with the appropriate category manager and, and send, uh, send the materials to sort of engage their interest and make sure that it's a productive meeting for both of you before you get on the calendar. Typically, they'll request that anyway, um, regardless of broker or not. Um, I think the, the thing I would say is most important is... Um, some, in some cases, the broker communities do provide um, capabilities around EDI and some of the other just real technical back and forth stuff that needs to happen in order to supply to us, um, in, you know, in just inventory and all of that. And so I you by no means need a broker, um, but you do need the capabilities to, to communicate with us on some of those back end things. Right. And if anyone needs a recommendation on a broker, you can certainly reach out to me. I can provide you with some names. Those decisions are up to you, but we have access to lots of brokers in the marketplace. Um, Andrew, here's a question. How do we get started selling at CVS.com? Is there an application process? What recommendations do you have? So I guess I got to go direct to the merchant for that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, here's a question. I think I know the answer. Are you focused on teens, Gen Z beauty products? So Wayne, you may have heard me say this before, but I'm going to say this again. So the very short answer is yes. But I think, you know, what's interesting to me always about what we are focused on is the enormous range of customers that come through our stores. I joke and not lightly as I have a 12 year old who I'm literally tracking because she's out walking to lunch with her friends right now. And like, you know, I know that I'm serving the beauty needs of that 12 year old walking into a CVS and buying the eyeshadow mom doesn't know about all the way up through, you know, when my local CVS has an assisted living community nearby and the bus comes in on Wednesdays. Right. And so we are serving that entire community. And in the middle of that is the household manager who's actually helping manage decisions across both sides. So yes, we are giving a lot of thought to Gen Z and teen focused brands. Um, which we'll do with a lens through not just what those 12 year olds are going to buy on their own, but also what, um, what will mom or whoever that caretaker is in the middle that's helping guide and make those decisions feel good about and feel like they're making healthy choices. Cause we know there's so much out there. And we know that, that, that informed caregiver has a really good understanding now of safety and is increasingly paying attention to it. Um, so yes, um, with a caveat of we'll do it through the lens of making sure that it, it's right for everybody in the mix. 
Yeah, great. Um, Andrea, what about the beauty associates in the stores? I know we talked about this in the past, and I shared with you an experience where a beauty associate helped uh, with some product assortment selection decisions between me and my mom when we were visiting recently. What's going on with the beauty associates? Um, so super excited about that program as well. We are um, at this point in about 650 stores. And um, we continue to, to build on that program. So um, they today have a streamlined training um, and a streamlined set of metrics that they're chasing. Um, but we're, it's also allowed us to make sure that we're providing consistent messaging across all of the experiences. So no matter what store you go into, they're focused on the same storylines. Um, and so that's actually a program we're really excited about and a plan to continue to build on because we do think it is a bit unique in mass to have a, a person that can help you pick a shade or... Um, figure out what's right for you. And they are really well-trained. Okay. All right. Let me see what else. I know we're coming to the end here, Andrea. I want to let you get back to your day. Um, you probably saw my early release child poking his head out behind Yes, you. we saw that. We saw that. That was great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <probably>. Okay. <laughs> let me Welcome see. Welcome to working from home, I guess. Yep. Okay. Uh, Andrea, is last question here. Is there any sneak peek without giving up too much information uh -oh. relative to anything we probably want to know relative to what's coming next? Yeah. And, that's and if you don't want to answer the question, that's fine too. I'm, I'm just going to say this. I'm just going to say we are laser focused on making sure that we can provide the right health and wellness experience and, and truly be a destination. So I think everything you're going to see and hear from us in the coming months will really be around building into that authority, that, that place I think we actually have of ownership given the role we've played in the last couple of years um, to continue to build into that, but do so in a way that is really customer centric in terms of how they think about their own wellness. Okay. Andrea, I know, uh, I guess in conclusion here, I know you have referred yourself in the past as a cheer mom. So, but I appreciate that. And I also appreciate you being a cheerleader for CVS, right? And, you know, uh, bringing forward the opportunities uh, to the supplier community who are very eager to do business with you, but to do it in a way that makes most sense for you and your organization. Uh, and I think, you know, it's understanding what's most important to you and your merchant team to support that effort with the supplier. So, you know, thank you for your time here today. I know we could probably spend another hour talking because the questions will come up, but here's what I'm going to do. Um, if anyone would like to reach out to me directly uh, and send me your question or send me just a general question about the industry, they certainly can. I will, if I think it's appropriate and timely, I will try to triage it to Andrea if I cannot answer it. Um, for those, my email is wbennett at ecrm.marketgate.com. Uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll just put that in the chat and you guys will see it. And if I can help in any way, I'll be happy to do so. I know there's some questions about contacts and things like that. Let me just put this in here right now and we'll let Andrea go. Uh, for those that want to get discovered at CVS, if you're not on the RangeMe platform, I do suggest you submitting into the RangeMe platform direct via the CVS website. There's no cost to do that. And that will write route to the appropriate merchant for discovery. And I think that's a, a one of the preferred paths to uh, to go. So yes, that's a great point, Wayne. Thank you for calling that out. That is probably the best way um, okay. to get well, to you make said sure that it gets not to me. the right person. So yes, the best way. It is the best way to get discovered uh, uh, by the merchant team. And uh, if you submit and you don't hear back within a reasonable time, let us know and we could probably uh, help, uh, help get you an answer. Uh, but beyond that, Andrea, I appreciate your time as always. Maybe we can do this again in a, in, in a quarter or in a couple of months, just as an update. Sure. And we'll reach out for that. Um, it's always great talking to you, Andrea. And uh, thank you for your time. And uh, we'll be in contact soon. For those who have joined us today, thank you very much. Everyone have a great afternoon. And uh, until next time. Thank you so much, Wayne. Take care. Bye. See you. Bye-bye.